I specifically remember a lot of industrial engineers do consulting. A lot of consulting is kind of process improvement in a way. But I felt like it didn't make sense to go work for a consulting company when you didn't have any experience. Cause I was like, I don't want to stand in front of a customer and be like, you should do this. And I'll be like, why? And I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> My textbook told me. Yeah. So that's why when this LinkedIn message came to me and I actually had, you know, some experience in Salesforce, I was like, oh, I actually could be a consultant because I kind of do know a little bit. Hello and welcome to the Dumb It Down podcast, breaking down the disconnect between school and work for engineers and more. Today, we're joined by Kevin McCann, a longtime friend of mine who I met at NC State, went on to do industrial engineering, and is now a Salesforce expert. So if you're wondering how you get from an engineer to a cloud computing customer resource management software platform, you are in luck. Side note, this episode was recorded in Costa Rica, so shout out to the Wi-Fi at our Airbnb, where my sister and I are currently quarantining. Don't worry, we're healthy, symptoms are gone, uh, but if you are watching on YouTube, we've got a great little backdrop for you too, so don't feel too bad for me. All right, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Dumb It Down podcast. I'm your host, Eric Larson, joining you from Costa Rica. More, more on that later, maybe. And uh, today we're joined by Kevin McCann, another long time college friend of mine and happy to have him on. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Long time listener, first time caller. There we go. Hey, the first person to use that one too. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kevin and I met back at NC State University. He now lives in Raleigh. He's got a pretty cool job and and background and career and all of the above. So excited to have you on. If you just want to say a little about how we met and then we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's see. So I went to NC State. And so that's where me and Eric met. I was actually at a go pack. I was at go the pack. out of state students meeting during orientation where I met our mutual friend, Stephen Taylor. Um, and I talked to him because he was wearing a shirt that said Bears beats Battlestar Galactica, which is obviously a quote from The Office, which is one of my favorite of shows. So <laughs> I walked up to him and was like, this guy needs to be my friend. He was a randomly assigned suite mate of yours, correct? That's correct. Um, and so what that's luck. how we met. Yeah. So Steve, we were friends immediately. And then he was like, come meet my suite mates and the rest is history. That it is. Yeah. And just to, for, our, for our Gen Z listeners out here. So The <laughs> Office is obviously a very funny show, a very like relevant show. I went into college i think liking the office and obviously you and steve did too but this is like 2010 this is before it was like the most basic thing on earth so just i just had to clarify yeah and i uh and of course i've seen it a million times but i also i don't know why but recently i've gotten even more into it so i actually listened to the the rewatch podcast as well so i'm now rewatching it all the way through for a probably third or fourth time and then also yeah. listening to the podcast. So that's probably about the nerdiest <laughs> office thing you can do. Yeah, well, you actually, both my sisters do as well. And I think that they like it. And they've got the extended episodes on NBC and all of that. So yeah, no, oh, that's yeah. that's too funny. And yeah, Steve was randomly assigned to suite mates. And then our group kind of formed pretty quick freshman, sophomore year. We lived together in a big suite sophomore year. Uh, me, Kevin, Curtis, Chris, Vlad, Evan, like everyone I've had on the show, which is pretty funny. <laughs> Apologies to Juan for being a business major, but maybe we'll chat anyway. Um, but cool. So let's let's rewind a little because life didn't start when you met me, unfortunately. But uh, we were talking before and you had a couple stories from high school and kind of how you got into engineering and that kind of thing. So I'll give you the floor. Yeah, absolutely. So um very classic, like grew up playing with Lego bricks. Uh, I liked science and math. Um, I was actually trying to think of back to it because I and I thought of some funny things that I feel like at the time seemed normal. And now it's kind of funny that it's, it's weird. But I actually my mom bought us multiplication game set that like you would have this card with a string on it. And it was like your eights 
multiplication table and you had to wrap the string around it and it had like numbers on one side and the solution on the other so you had to be like eight times seven is 56 eight times two and you had to like match all of this and mm-hmm. it's just like I feel like not other kids played math games. Like I remember sitting, like I remember we're literally sitting on the couch as a kid, and that's what we're doing. We're not watching TV. We're like playing a math multiplication game, which is just kind of silly. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that clearly, and so right. uh, so yeah, so I definitely like science and math. So engineering was always kind of kind of there. My uncle is a civil engineer, so that was kind of the only engineering I had heard of. Um, and so two things on that, I remember. When I was a kid, I didn't really understand adults' jobs. And so I thought it would make more sense to have a job that made sense, if that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so I thought it would be cool to say, <laughs> like, I was like, okay, if I'm my kid is asking me, Dad, what do you do? I was like, oh, I could point at a bridge and be like, oh, I built that bridge. I want a job like that. That's like, oh, you, which the, the ultimate irony is I don't have a job like that. But so I thought civil engineering would be cool because you would give you that, that you're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a civil engineer. I build that bridge. Like it yeah. makes sense. It's easy. And so um, I also remember I did a research project, if you can call it that, because I was in like fourth grade, um, that they're like, you know, find a future career that you want. And I did that on a civil engineer. So I think most most of my childhood for sure was like science and math based getting into middle school and high school was like, I had civil engineering as kind of the mindset of what I would probably do, but really didn't think about it all that much because I was a kid. So anyway, so that, that was kind of the story and then looked at engineering schools and then applied to a handful of them. And then I got into all five I applied to and, NC State was the cheapest and farthest from home. So that was kind of how I landed on that. <laughs> that was that was a pro for you. Yeah, Kevin, you're from Connecticut. So that is a little kind of a drive. Born, yeah, born and raised in Connecticut and grew up in New England, which I love, but I was looking for something different. And so NC State gave me that. So that, uh, yeah, that's my, my engineering origin story. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, I didn't realize that your uncle was a civil engineer. So, right, if you have some kind of example to point to, even if it's just a bridge, a a title, you can work with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and math and science, too. I mean, I think that that's certainly a common thread for engineers. So, very good. So, moving forward, applied to NC State, got into NC State, selected NC State, came in undeclared, which I think most of us did. And made Correct. your way to industrial engineering. How did that come about? Yeah, so we had, um, I believe there was an introductory engineering class where they taught you here E-101. all the different. E101, yeah. All, here are all the different engineering and here's what they do. And I specifically remember that it was assigned to us that we had to go to an informational session for you know one or two uh, engineering classes so i remember i went to the industrial engineering info session and i went to the civil engineering one and i think i went to the civil engineering one first because again i had that mindset of like the only engineer i know is a civil engineer i did a project on it i think it would be cool to build bridges that might be an architect anyway i don't mm-hmm. know but i go into that cl- i go into that session and i just remember the first thing they did was review all the classes and I always joke that the guy was like, you know, oh, we have Dirt 101, Dirt 201, Dirt 301. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see this presentation. It just seemed really boring to me. Yeah. Um, and so then I kind of immediately was like, all right, civil engineering is not for me. And I don't even remember why I went into the industrial engineering class, because I had never even heard of industrial engineering until I got to college. So E101, that class was, you know, kind of what introduced me to it. Um, and it was led by... Uh, Dr. VP, which I think you talked about with, with the, in the Jess episode. Is that, what is her was, name? Is that a, uh, like her initials? Uh, her last name is Vila Parish. I see. So Doc, her, yeah, that I think confused it's, me. <laughs> yeah, Dr. VP. Anyway, Dr. VP shout sure. out Dr. VP. Shout out Dr. VP. I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> So and and I so I remember her info session was you know this is what industrial engineering is and the example was she basically said if you like watching how it's made the Discovery Channel show you should be an industrial engineer and I was like I love that show mm-hmm. I love seeing machinery and how stuff works and you know the behind the scenes like that stuff fascinated me so just that one sentence alone I left that room being like well now I'm going to be an industrial engineer I didn't know what that was until <laughs> well, an hour ago but that's that's what I'm going to do so. 
Yeah, well, and, you know, problem solving, like Lego building, like I know when I grew up, there was instructions to set up like technology, whether it's your router or whatever, uh, has always kind of interested me too. So yeah, kind of, kind of the same thing, how stuff works and industrial engineer certainly teaches you that. One question, just because we kind of touched on it before, but you said that there wasn't really like a guidance counselor, either pushing you to a major or pushing you to a you know, concentration. It, that's that's all just stuff you kind of came across or well, I guess looking back, was there someone who made that impression for you? Yeah, it was uh, it was mostly my mom. So I think we'll talk about this later, but uh, probably some of the only regrets I have is I, I think I probably should have done a little more research on that. So right. I don't even know that I chose the colleges I applied to. I remember she was like, uh, yeah, you're good at math and science. And I was like, yeah, I could probably do an engineer. And she's like, here's a list of 30 schools that have good engineering. And we, we go from there. So I, I didn't have that. I did have that influence from my mom. So she is to thank for me going to NC State for sure, because NC State was on the list. Um, right. But I believe she just Googled, you know, top engineering schools, probably knew I wasn't going to get into like Ivy League anything. So it was, you know, the middle of the road, but good engineering schools. <laughs> yeah, slightly above average. I, I took an engineering class in high school as well. So that was also some of the exposure that we had that I actually forgot that I even did until I started thinking about this, uh, this yeah. <laughs> interview that we were going to do. It's like, oh, yeah, I took an engineering class in high school, so I must have known what I was doing. Yeah, cool. And then industrial engineering. Jess Rose was on here. She was in your program. Steve Taylor, the uh, the guy who brought us together, I guess, technically, will probably mm -hmm. be on at some point, was also industrial engineer. Um, so, yeah, just a little on that program and uh, where he ended up senior year. Yeah, so what I liked about industrial engineering was that it kind of taught you about to think of the processes and how to improve things, but it was very focused, at least at NC State, on manufacturing. So I actually was also the president of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, which oh. was a lot of fun. SME, that's right. <laughs> yeah, SME. We got to tour a bunch of different factories. So like I led a tour group to Pepsi and we got to see how they make all the bottles and fill the machines. And we went to NC State's ice cream factory. And again, it's that whole how it's made basically trying to do that in real life. Like we got to yeah. do it. So that re it really interests me. But all of these places to me was more of like a cool place to visit, not necessarily work. Um, mm. Just because it was, you know, all, all the all the industrial engineering jobs you could get were usually in manufacturing and usually far away and out in the woods. So sure. senior year came down to that decision of you got two paths, basically one a little more broad than the other. But one is, you know, go be an industrial engineer and you could apply to a manufacturing facility and you could go work there and be an industrial engineer or do anything else. <laughs> and so that was kind of the road I was leaning towards, which was, a little scarier because I it's so open ended. Like, right, I don't want to go work in a manufacturing facility, but what can I do with this right. uh, degree that I apply it that someone will hire me? And so um, I I think it was just by by luck. But a woman who was industrial engineer at NC State, she was an alum, came to our senior design class and basically was like, "Hey, I did NC State industrial engineering. I work for IBM." Um, I want industrial engineers on my team. And mm -hmm. so she put out a job description for it. I applied it, applied for it, and, and I got it. Um, yeah, so to pause for a, one sec. A, so sure. <laughs> that first track, like being an industrial engineer, like I, I've heard that for mechanical too, like mechanical engineer one, if you're at a plant or something. Like what, what, what is the, that role? Like I don't even know today. It's a, it's a good question because even saying an industrial engineer is like also super broad. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of different categories you could do. So I think it depended on which, which type um, you did. So like, I know one job I actually interviewed for and I don't even remember the company, but they flew me down there. Basically they were going to start building a new product. And so the job was to spin up the floor where you actually build the product. So you mm -hmm. would be leading like, you know, uh, is there going to be a table here or a table over here? Uh, how long are we going to estimate it take to, you know, turn this screw that's then going to be drilled into this hole? 
uh, yeah. you know, how many people should be working here, how long should it take them to do it, and you'd actually design all that. So I think that would be one aspect is like working on a product line. Okay. Um, there's also like quality control is a, is a big uh, area too that you could do. So you could be an industrial engineer and doing quality. So it would be like um, a good example was uh, so a company like Revlon when you're making uh, labels, if they smudge, you're trying to figure out, oh, no, this label, you know, smudged too much. How do we fix that? How do we yeah. increase the amount of things that aren't broken, that kind of thing? Um, and you could also do time studies. So you could come to a come to an already existing product line where they're manufacturing something and figure out, like, okay, how long does it take this guy to turn the screw this way? What if we give him a different tool? What if we have two people do it? What if they're standing or sitting uh, okay. you know, again, moving around those tables, that kind of thing. So that would probably be what a typical industrial engineer would do. But again, I didn't research it that much because I didn't end up wanting to do it. So sure. No, fair enough. And yeah, even, even me, I, I did the same thing. It was like a mechanical engineer. What do you typically do? It's either manufacturing or design, um, or mm -hmm. research and none of those appealed to me. So, right. The second category is literally everything else, like this huge broad swap. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of why, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking now and I'm trying to do this podcast is because there are so many different things and it's nice to see someone take one road and, and see where it got them. So your road led you to IBM, obviously a very large company with a bunch of stuff you could even do just inside that company. Uh, did you end up working for her directly who came to the school then? Um, I, yeah, I did. And I, I did. And I didn't, um, which is kind of funny. But so, so the story is, so she built a team called the process excellence team that we basically did process oh. improvement. But instead of for a manufacturing site, we did mm -hmm. it for uh, like a, it's kind of like a sales operations team. So we were actually looking at instead of how long does it take the guy to turn the screw, we were looking at how long does it take to build this file that's then converted into a PDF and emailed to another team who then has to look at the PDF and enter it into a software system on their I computer. See. Like internal business processes. Correct. Yeah. So this would be like uh, the people you have your sales team and then they submit their order or whatever. This is like right after that. Like, how do you get how do you get a salesperson who closed a deal? How do we actually deliver software or deliver hardware and okay. make sure that we recognize that as revenue, that kind of stuff. So the the work itself, what the people were doing, who we were working with was super boring. But what we were doing with it was cool because we were uh, number one, we got to fly around the world. So I went to a lot of really cool places. Oh. Um, but uh, it was cool because we would just interview people and try to improve their processes. And it was, it was fun because you felt like you were really helping people and having an impact, which is what I liked. So it was like, yeah, I see this person, I talk to them and I can tell like they are reading PDFs and entering them into a software system all day, every day. And mm -hmm. even, you know, saving them 30 seconds of time a day extrapolates into hours and a month and a week and, and stuff like that. So they were excited to be helped, which is what I liked about it too. Cause like, Hey, this process is broken, but we don't have time to fix it. And so we would come in and try to help them do that. Um, but the reason I laughed when you asked if, if I worked for her was she created this team in it and then I was hired. Um, cause I think she hired us in like February. So she created the team in February and hired us, but of course we didn't graduate yet. But by the time I graduated in May and joined the team, she had actually left for a new role. <laughs> so nice. it was the team she built and it was still her like idea and her, uh, you know, the team that she built, she hired all the people that worked there, but then she ended up, uh, leaving, yeah. but yeah, leaving, yeah, but for a different role, but down the hallway. So I still talk to her all the time. Um, and that was nice, but. Yeah, that, that's nice. And that's just typical big companies. Like the lady who recruited and hired yeah. me wasn't the leader of like the group that I started in at Schneider Electric either. So that's just how it goes. But yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, I, I know when I was stumbling around the career fair, you see all the big companies and you're familiar with some and uh, with the smaller ones, you're not. So of course, a big name like IBM, I'm sure kind of drew you in and uh, you did a couple good years there, eventually switched tracks. Uh, so yeah, I guess let's talk about, oh, I guess there was two roles now that I'm thinking about it. So what, you know, what did, what kind of prompted you to make a job switch? And then what was the next role you took? Yeah. So the first one, um, I did that, uh, PE team for a while. So like I said, we were traveling around the globe, helping people, mm -hmm. um, 
basically improve their processes. What basically happened was our budget was cut, and so we stopped being able to fly around the country. <laughs> which, now that I think about it, was you know it was very expensive to fly these four right. people to Bratislava and interview people that nowadays I'm sure you could do Bratislava. I want to do because it's yeah yeah we went to Budapest, Bratislava, Switzerland. Um, so we didn't have the budget to fly around the world. So now it was like, and then like I said, sh- this woman who created the team left. And then our current boss kind of did the same thing. She just got a new job. So I actually had a period of a few months where I had a job and I had a title and I had a paycheck, but I didn't have a boss and we didn't have budget to do what we were supposed to be doing. So it was really awkward because I was just like, come to work at nine o'clock in the morning, open my computer. And we would just like hang out because we didn't really know what to do, which uh, was a lot of fun for a really short period of time until it was really mm-hmm. scary because you're working for this giant company that's known for laying people off, and all of a sudden you realize you don't have a you don't have a a boss or a, or anything to do. And so I started looking around at other uh, at other jobs within IBM. Um, and so I actually found there was a team that was going to spin up this tool called Salesforce, which I had never heard of. Mm-hmm. And so I was still in touch with my old boss, although she had moved on to a different role. And so she recommended me for this new job. So I got a new job inside of IBM, um, learning this tool called Salesforce that they were starting for the first time. Basically, no one had ever heard of it and no one, or not, not heard of it, but no one had ever used it before. Um, and so we actually, I joined this team and we all just got certified and we just started working on Salesforce. Um, that was an internal position in your portal that you just kind of saw and thought would be interesting, right? Um, I believe my boss recommended me for it. I don't think okay. I ever physically applied on a role or anything. It was like, hey, Kevin, you're going to work for Gary now. And then I was like, cool, nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> Phenomenal. Oh, a boss. That's yeah. funny. Well, and one thing you just kind of threw in there on IBM, but you said that you got a kind of piece of advice when you took the IBM job that didn't paint them in the best light. <laughs> Do you want to share uh, that? Uh, yeah, I did. I thought that was that was kind of funny. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I remember senior year of college, everybody's getting their jobs. Um, I applied to a million different jobs, and I didn't hear back from pretty much anybody and so when that ibm opportunity came up the job was cool the woman i was going to work for was awesome i was excited to work there um and i remember one of my uh, one of my engineering teachers was like oh you got you got a job where at i was like oh i'm gonna go work for ibm and he's like oh they lay everybody off have fun with that and (laughs) that was just like really awkward um (laughs) yeah but it's but it's true unfortunately so yeah so that was my uh (laughs) my motivation as the one job i got that I applied for and heard back and was offered. The only person I had told was like not excited about it. <laughs> so yeah, it's such, it is a stressful time. I mean, there's there's so much out there that in terms of types of roles and stuff. So to actually get a job and then get kind of a smack in the face, and it's also unfortunate that it turned out to be true. But they're big corporations. They've got cultural issues and just large issues and things like that. Well, and it's extra funny now because then you moved to a different role and, uh, and interacted even more with IBM. So what was, yeah. what did that look like? Well, should we, uh, should we explain what Salesforce is for anyone who doesn't know? Probably. Absolutely. Be, Thanks Kevin. Very, yeah, that's very, smart. very pertinent to my job now and this whole story. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, Salesforce is a CRM, which is a customer resource management tool. So we'll dumb it down for you. Yeah. So it's a software that sales teams will log into and they basically say, I'm trying to sell this product to this customer and it tracks what did you sell to who and why. And it's infinitely more complicated than that, but that's the simplest version <laughs> of it is a, is a sales team uses it to track the data of uh, the sales process. So, so right. IBM yeah. was trying to use Salesforce because they had built their own CRM from mm. scratch and it just started, they started to realize it wasn't very good. Um, so I guess they had been using it forever and then wanted to switch to Salesforce. So we were actually spinning up an instance of Salesforce for IBM to sell one product on. So they had a, they had a SaaS product, I think, that they were trying to sell. So we were basically piloting, hey, let's stop using IBM's homegrown CRM and let's Mm -hmm. build our own Salesforce because this is a company who does it 
as their job, whereas we just made it because we wanted to, um, because it was cheaper at the time. So, right. Well, yeah, I think, I think big companies do a lot of that. I know at Schneider, they had their own like quoting tool that looked like it was from the early nineties. And even when I was working there, I was like, what? As they had built it themselves and then it was integrated in their process and then they didn't want to replace it. And we actually replaced it with Salesforce. So I was, I was pretty familiar with what they did. And they're like one of the top 10, I don't know what the ranking is, but an enormous company now. So obviously yeah. what they do has a ton of value. And as a salesperson, having used it, like I think either you're using a software that doesn't do as much or you're doing a lot of like handshakes and stuff on paper and signing. Mm-hmm. Like there's so much that Salesforce can capture in terms of your calls and your meetings and who's going to buy this and how much it costs that is very important to business. So I can, yeah. And co-sign. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I think they had uh, the original CRM they built themselves was a long time ago, and I think it was when they were mostly selling hardware. So I think the other thing was you sell a server, it's always going to cost X amount of dollars, it's always going to have to be shipped. It was all a pretty simple sales process. And when they started selling like services and software that was like being renewed on a certain basis, and contracts got really complicated, all of a sudden, I think then that was when they realized, like, oh, we it will cost more to try to fix our broken tool than to just buy a new one. Um, so that yeah. was the team. That was the team I joined, not knowing what Salesforce was, never using anything related to sales at all because we were three industrial engineers in a process improvement team. <laughs> um, but it was a new job that was exciting because it was something new that I had used internal IBM tools before, and I knew they all were not great. So the <laughs> the 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 for the first, probably one of the very few times they were paying for like an industry leader tool. It was like, oh, cool. Like they're putting a lot of money into this. It's going to be an investment and it's going to be exciting because it's new and different. Um, so I joined, I joined that team and turned out to have like a pretty toxic boss who was kind of a jerk. Um, oh. And so what basically happened was I worked for him and like the project was really exciting. And what I was learning was awesome. And I really liked Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And I saw the value of it, but I stopped. I didn't want to work for that team anymore. And I wasn't really sure that I wanted to be working for IBM anymore as well. Um, And I was telling uh, like a good example of what this, this boss would do. I I specifically remember there'd be like Friday nights at 6 PM. We're on a zoom call and he's like trying to get me to build some report in Salesforce. And I'm just like, Hey, like, I really want to go home. <laughs> How urgent so, is this? Uh, yeah, and it was not urgent because it was a pilot system and I was like some 20 something, whatever, you know, like not really that important to build this tool, but he was very much a workaholic. Mm. And he was probably the only person I've ever worked with that was like, like actually got mad and yelled at work. Oh. Like I would say everyone else I worked for at IBM was amazing and they were super nice and like, you always hear stories about people getting yelled at at work and that never happened to me. But then this started to happen. It was like, okay, I I gotta, (laughs) so basically trying to do the same thing as, as the first job move that was like, Hey, I I like what I'm doing, but I don't want to work for this person. And so I looked, I looked at internal um, IBM jobs, but I I didn't really see any that I liked. And so I saw an opportunity for a sales operations analyst role at a company called Red Hat. And Mm -hmm. I saw that you got to work with Salesforce and you did a lot of data analysis and it was in Raleigh and downtown. So it was super exciting. So I applied and then I got that job and then I left IBM. So there we go. Which actually, uh, was, it was interesting about that job is I actually didn't get the job I applied for. So I was interviewing for an analyst position without any analyst experience, but I was like, I like data and numbers. I could probably do this. And the woman interviewing me was basically stopped halfway through and was like, Hey, I don't really think you're a good fit for this job, but I actually want you on my team instead. And so I actually got, yeah. So she was like, Hey, like slid me a different job role basically during the interview for a a totally different role. Wow. Um, So I didn't get that first role, but then I interviewed, I I think I came back like 
it ended up being a super long time. I think I came back like three or four months later or something to finally interview for this job just because of all the paperwork and red tape. Nice. Like, I had to go physically apply on their website and then they had to review my resume, but then I ended up coming back. But the second interview went much better because <laughs> I had already interviewed with this woman. So I was like, Hey, like, that's nice to see you. So the second interview was actually barely an interview. It was mostly just going right. through the motions. So like, we already interviewed you. I already know you. I think you're going to like this job a lot better and you're going to be better at it. And so that was uh, why I joined that, that team. So. Yeah. Uh, the, it's interesting. Yeah. Where, where you get pulled. Cause there's, there's so many job descriptions and titles online that really don't mean much. So even if you think you're a fit, it's nice. You were a fit with the company, which she kind of proved out, but right. Red hat for anyone unfamiliar. Um, so, so Kevin stayed in the area for IBM of NC State in downtown Raleigh and Red Hat sponsors the amphitheater and they have a big office, I'm sure. And they're like a, a very much a growing Raleigh company. So it's nice that that worked out for you. And then a couple years later, you switched again. <laughs> yeah, I did. Kind of. um, <laughs> yeah, I think pretty much every job I've had was definitely like a step up and incrementally better. Like I really liked that first job and the travel was cool, but obviously it wasn't sustainable. I really liked the second job that was like, Oh, Salesforce is cool. I'm using my brain. I'm building reports and doing stuff, but I hate my boss. Red Hat was like a really great mix of the two things. I was using Salesforce and I was doing some data analysis, but I was also doing a lot of process improvement work similar to the first job that okay. we were working hand in hand with sales teams. That was like, you know, how can a salesperson do this type of the sales process even better? And we were actually implementing new technology internally. So we, we basically were in charge of all the internal software tools. Any Anything a salesperson touched on their computer, we were kind of in charge of. But we were at the angle of like, how can they use this software the most efficiently and, and, and do that? Yeah. What's one um, quick example of like a process you improved for the sales team? Uh, so the biggest one was we we put in a tool called Aptis, which is a quoting tool. So basically, um, there was in order to for a salesperson to create a quote. So if they have a customer that says we want to buy Red Hat software, the customer says how much is it? So in the simple, it, it's not simple, but it should be is basically like I need to email them a PDF that says how much I'm charging them. So at the at the simplest level, that's obviously what a quote is, right? Um, but because Red Hat likes to complicate everything. It would be like, oh, but this customer 15 years ago, they were allowed to buy it at this price. And they're going to actually, they have three or four contracts they're going to renew. But one is a year long, one's three years long, one's actually four and a half years long. Oh, and they're also going to pay, you know, every six months instead of up front. And how much, oh, but then there's tax and like how much money. And it's basically just a super complicated way of trying to figure out how much to charge somebody and have someone know what they're being charged. Mm -hmm. And so the tool they were using basically didn't have any guardrails. So like it was very simple in that you would just type in like, here's the person's name, here's how much I'm charging them. So what Aptis does inside of Salesforce is basically has your product catalog and doesn't allow it doesn't allow you to sell something you can't or at a price you're not allowed to. And so we made it so that they could build quotes faster. So you go in and you like grab your product, you grab your customer and you basically say, this is how much it's going to cost. But then we put in a lot of guardrails um, for things like, oh, you can add a discount, but if you add more than this discount, it has to go to your manager to approve right. it. But then it's like, um, they need an email to get notified that they need to approve it. So we build an automation to say, you know, send emails faster and do things like that. So cool. it wasn't necessarily a process improvement project, but it was stuff like that. They were like, here's a new tool that you're going to use and it's better for the company and it's faster in this way, but also maybe stop you from doing things you weren't allowed to do. Um, Cause Red Hat, Red Hat when I was there was very much just like a, a corporate startup. So they're yep. the size of a big corporation but they acted like they were a startup. So they kind of were like, oh, we can make up whatever processes right. we want and we'll just do whatever because we've been doing it, so. Yeah, that's that's cool experience. I know having worked for a big and small company, uh, the the startup culture and you know, you're just like grow, grow, grow. And then things aren't as efficient as they could be. So that's where kind of you come back to the industrial engineering mindset where you're making processes more efficient. And there's right. a very pertinent example that I know 
me and James and Chris and all the salespeople have been on and will hopefully continue to listen to this are like, oh, that does make sense. <laughs> and that's why we have to do things like build a quote and, you know, have some checks and balances. So that's, that's yeah. cool. Um, and then, go ahead. I was just going to say that the reason I joined that team was because it was pitched as process improvement for a sales team and you get to use Salesforce. Um, but kind of it turned into a, we're going to implement software. And so it started to be like kind of this roller coaster of like, there were really exciting points where it was like, Oh, we're like talking to people and gathering their requirements. And we have this launch date that we're building towards, but then there'd be this lull of like, we already did it. Like we would like, you know, starting a project was exciting. The middle part was kind of stressful. And then the end was exciting, but then in between two, it would be really boring. And so it, it wasn't, we weren't doing as much. Like, it's funny that you said, how did you improve the sales process? And I tell a story about a software we installed that probably added time to a salesperson's time anyway. <laughs> so I started to, so I started to realize like, oh, I'm not really improving. We're not not improving anything, but it's right. not the process improvement like that I joined for, like that was the reason why I joined it. And I think I also said earlier what was exciting about my first job was the people we were helping were excited to be helped. They are like, hey, mm -hmm. please help me. This takes too long. I want your help. Where at Red Hat, some of the stuff we started to implement, not necessarily our fault, but just the way things worked, we were adding time to people. And so they hated us. Like oh, they're like, I don't want, I don't want to go into Salesforce. They're like, I want to fly to my customer and look them in the eye and shake their hand. Like, I don't care where the data and the pricing comes from. And we were like, but we do, like someone does. And so it started <laughs> yeah. to get to that point where you're like, man, the people I'm trying to help don't want to be helped. And I'm no longer, I was like, you know, I got an industrial engineering degree, but I didn't feel like one because I wasn't mm. helping improve anybody's processes. And so I kind of got to the same point as I was at, um, at IBM that I was like, I still really like Salesforce and I still want to use it. And I love Red Hat and I like what they're doing but my job is not what I thought it would be and what I wanted. Um, so I did the same thing. I was originally looking at other jobs inside of Red Hat, um, but it's, like I said, it's um, it's a larger company-ish, but it's, there's not a lot of areas. Yes, yeah, so they also got bought by <laughs> IBM. So, right, after so you well, left them. <laughs> after I, yeah, I got a lot, of, uh, a lot of LinkedIn messages from old IBM coworkers, yeah. <laughs> like immediately like, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, so they're like Red Hat CEO left and I really liked him. So he went to go work for IBM. Um, and so it just like, it was just very different. We're like, you know, a different CEO owned by IBM. My job wasn't all that different, but it felt different. That like the culture was still there, but it was kind of like, we're not a cool, fun startup anymore. Right. Like, not that it really was when I was there anyway. There were 11,000 people, but um, Damn. I, I think it went from 11,000 to 22 when I was there, something like that. Wow. So, it was, yeah, it was big growth. Um, but in terms of things that I could do, there weren't that many areas because their biggest areas are, you know, the actual like tech teams that are building products. So I was like, well, I'm not technical enough to go build open source mm -hmm. software and the sales operations team I'm on, there's only like 15 people. So I'm like, I can't, I can't do anything else in sales operations because that's sure. it. I know everyone. I know all the things they do. Like there's nothing else for me here. So um, and then honestly, it was a super good timing. I randomly got a message on LinkedIn from someone who works for a company called Cloud Giants, which is where I work now. Um, it was a COO and she messaged me and was like, hey, we really want to hire a business analyst who knows Salesforce to be a Salesforce consultant. Would you be interested? Um, and I'll share a tip that I got. This is kind of funny how um, I feel like every job I've had got me my next job. And so like, Mm -hmm. IBM taught me Salesforce and that was how I was able to apply to Red Hat because I needed Salesforce experience and Red Hat got me <laughs> my cloud giants job because I took a LinkedIn course at Red Hat because we were trying to build in, we we're basically trying to integrate LinkedIn into Salesforce and all this other uh. stuff. So, so we took a course that LinkedIn came and they're like, here's how you use LinkedIn if you're a salesperson. So it was um, like, basically like, how do you, how do you cold call through a LinkedIn uh, in mail message was basically the class that I took. And, um, one of the, one of the guys in the class who worked at Red Hat was like, Hey, here's a really cool tip. Um, for your LinkedIn name, put your middle initial in your first name. So my name on LinkedIn is Kevin J McCann. And the reason you do that is because a robot 
who pulls the variable first name and says, hi, first name, you'll get a LinkedIn message that says, hi, Kevin J. And he said, you'll know immediately that a robot is talking to you or a person because That's a person so will smart. say, hi, Kevin, and a robot will say, hi, Kevin J. And so I did that and I immediately was like, oh my God, like LinkedIn messages are so easy now that anytime I see hi, Kevin J, automatically delete because it's, it's either like, it's either a robot or like a mass recruiter that you're, you're, right. you're probably not, not that interested in. And so I got this message from this woman who's a COO at a startup in North Carolina that says, hi, Kevin. And I was like, oh, this is legit. Oh, that's and so, so cool. I got to do that yeah. immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what was so funny was I was like, man, I for sure only got this job at Cloud Giants because I got a message that said, hi, Kevin. And I knew it was a real person. And I responded back to her and we talked about the job opportunity. And had yeah. I not gotten this tip from that guy, I think it would have just gotten lost in the sea of email messages. It's like, you can't tell the difference between a recruiter who's working for some third, fifth party thing. And like this woman who is like uh, in a leadership position at this company that wants to hire you. That's like, Oh, this is real. Yeah. That's so cool. And it yeah, worked. And uh, it did work. It was a long, it was also a long process. Um, <laughs> kind of similar to how Red Hat worked out that I applied to this job. I interviewed for it and then I didn't get it. But they were like, hey, we don't want you for this job. <laughs> it, w it wasn't the same in that they weren't like, go apply to this one. But they were like, we don't want you for this job. We want you for this other job. But technically, it doesn't exist yet. So you're right. going to have to hold tight. And so basically, what happened was like, I was applying for a job like I was way underqualified for. Like They were like, we want someone who's got 10 years of Salesforce consulting experience. Oh. And I was like... Well, I have five years of Salesforce experience, but no consulting. <laughs> so like half the time and then half the requirements. This is for the job she sent you a link to? You were still underqualified, but she just liked your background, I guess. All right. It, yeah, pretty wild. The, that, that, that's what was so funny about it was that I wasn't just like, I wasn't searching for 10-year experience Salesforce consultants job. Right. She, was, she was searching for people in Raleigh who have a business analyst background um, and also I believe she went to NC state and also worked at red hat. So she was oh. actually doing like LinkedIn searches. It's like kind of felt the same way. I was like, I liked red hat when I worked there and I know what it's like to work there. And I know people who work there do good work. So I would want people to come yep. as well. And my, uh, I believe my CEO also went to NC state. So they really oh. liked NC state grad and also worked at red hat. So they, they saw <laughs> you went to NC state and you work at red hat. We want you to come work for us. We don't yeah. even care if you're underqualified. So. Cool. Yeah, so they it was basically like here's like a senior role and the junior role doesn't exist yet, but we're gonna gotcha. make it. And so God, it was probably so six months. At. It was probably six months later they're like, Hey, it exists now. Can you apply? And so yeah. I applied, I did the interview and then uh, it went really well. So that's what I am at right now. Yeah. So in a nutshell, what is it that you're doing now? Yeah, so I'm a lead Salesforce consultant. So uh, basically, we have clients that um, have a multitude of Salesforce problems. So sometimes it's spinning up Salesforce for the first time. So they're like, we're moving from using a spreadsheet to using Salesforce. Um, I'm actually specializing in Salesforce CPQ, which stands for configure price quote. So it's actually Salesforce's version of what I did at Red Hat that was here's how you spin up a way to have a salesperson quote inside of Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Um, and so most of my projects are that, but what I like about it that's different from Red Hat was when you worked at Red Hat, we only have one quoting tool. So you build it, you install it, and then you're done. That's and it. that was the part that I didn't like that was like, well, when I was done, then now what do I do? But now <laughs> as a consultant, I have multiple clients. So I have a three month project that a client comes in, we build out a tool so that they can build quotes and automate their sales process and then they leave. And then I have another customer and then I do it again. So it's yeah. exciting because it's like, oh, I'm always doing this. Um, and so we're inside of Salesforce doing that. Um, but again, it, it depends on, we have small clients, we have big clients. Some people are starting Salesforce for the first time. Some people are installing quoting tool. And then um, I don't do it as much, but we also have admin as a service. So you could have a customer that basically just pays for you to do anything Salesforce. Oh, cool at all so you might get an email it's like hey can you build the sales report for me or they might be like hey can you create a new field that's a drop down we have to change how our pricing model works something like that so interesting yeah it's it kind of reminds me my company's like a niche consultant who does the same thing for big customers small customers and yeah you, you totally fit the mold for what they're looking for 
with your background. And yeah, looking back five years ago, 10 years ago, you'd probably never be like, oh, I'm a Salesforce consultant. That sounds far from industrial engineering, but hey, here we are. Yeah, yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, I mean, five years ago, I didn't even know what Salesforce was. I specifically remember a lot of industrial engineers do consulting. I think for similar reasons that um, a lot of consulting is kind of process improvement in right. a way. Um, and it's just exciting, like I said, because you got different clients all the time. You're always doing fun stuff. But um, I didn't, I, I actually did not want to be a consultant when I got out of college. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were, but I felt like it didn't make sense to go work for a consulting company when you didn't have any experience. Because I was <laughs> like, I don't want to stand in front of a customer and be like, you should do this. And I'll be like, why? And I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> my textbook told me yeah so that's why when this linkedin message came to me and i actually had you know some experience in Salesforce, so i was like oh i actually could be a consultant because i kind of cool. do know a little bit um and they uh cloud giants prides themselves in like growing and learning too so it's also like hey if you don't know how to be a consultant we're gonna train you like if you're a good fit and you're smart and we like you then we'll help you be a consultant and yeah. like we literally Salesforce is also great because um, Salesforce posts their own training and certifications and stuff online. So literally anybody can go right, right. sign up and learn how to do Salesforce because they want you to learn how to do it because then you'll buy it from them. So. Exactly. Yeah. No. And, and LinkedIn too, like they've got all these trainings and everything's integrating and software is eating the world and all the above, but it's good to mm -hmm. uh, have a couple of years of background in it and uh, be able to help others. So that's yeah, awesome. I'm, uh, I'm like already forecasting the next job change, you know, like I love cloud giants and I can see myself growing here, but I am interested to see how long I stick with consulting because the, I think the only problem I have with it is that process improvement mindset that at the end of the day, sometimes you do have to do what a customer says. And so like we, mm -hmm. we push for best practices and we try to build them, you know, to be efficient, but basically they buy a set amount of hours from us and they're like, you know, you have to do this in this amount of hours. And so sometimes if you have a good idea, that's like, oh, we could also do this. Oh, but we don't have time to do it. You basically are leaving them with something um, that could be a little bit better. And so it does, uh, I do wonder if the, it might be more interesting to be, basically try to find a way that I can build back in that full, you know, process improvement into what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's, you know, that cloud exists. Giants gets, I don't, yeah, I don't know if that exists somewhere else or like cloud giants gets big enough that I then am like, Oh, Kevin's the, you know, lead industrial engineer, you know, process improvement of our Salesforce instance, you know, so it's gotcha. like you go back to the old implementations and try to improve them or, or what, or, or huh. work like, you know, work on internal stuff. Like if we get big enough um, that they would need kind of a, a similar internal role like that. So yeah no that's that's good to keep thinking about the next step too um and one of the questions i ask is like what's your ideal project so i think you kind of you kind of answered that there and, and throughout what you're talking about um leading away from work or your your day job i guess uh another question i'll ask is like what's something that you care about or are excited about and i figured we have to touch on some of your side projects too so the dog treats and um some some brewing experience what do you yes. what do you got going on these days oh i have i have so much going on it's <laughs> it's silly yeah so i uh i started brewing my own beer probably i don't remember five years ago i had an old college roommate uh but let, he used to make uh cider i think in mead and he got me into it Who? and then i found some other john bruce <laughs> Oh, duh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, he used to tell these stories of him and his, so he transferred from NC state to a different college and his new roommates got him into it. And he would tell these stories of, they were just like making cider and meat and beer in these giant, like 15 gallon glass vats. And like, he had all these stories about it. So I thought that was cool. So I would try yeah. it out. Should have been juice. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> So I started making beer because uh, I've always liked drinking beer and then turns out you can make it yourself. And uh, part of the beer brewing process, you basically mix water and grain and then you separate them and the water then becomes beer and you throw out the grain. And when I was looking at all this wet grain that I was just throwing in the trash, I was like, you know, I feel like this is a waste. Like we're getting rid of all of this wet grain. What, what can you do with it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I Googled, you know, what do you do with spent grain? 
And a lot of people were like, oh, you can make dog treats. And so there's all these YouTube videos about, you know, people making dog treats for themselves. Um, but my wife at the time worked at a retail store and she was like, well, we could also sell them. And so we were like, great, let's do it. <laughs> um, but I don't make enough beer to sell the dog treats. And I really liked going to local breweries. So I was like, hey, why don't we just get their grain? Like they're also just throwing it out. Yeah. And I also like going to breweries. So it was kind of like a fun way to make a little money on the side but also make a bunch of brewery contacts and so i would just go you know on my lunch break i go to trophy brewing and i scoop a big bucket of grain oh, and i take it home and dry it but i usually you know chat with the brewer and have a beer so yeah oh that's cool yeah i knew bits and pieces of that but yeah the the whole story makes a lot of sense you're improving a process would you look at that exactly. efficient. yeah I, I wish we uh we definitely don't take a so like i'll take a five gallon bucket but that's out of like a 200 gallon bin so we're barely a drop in the bucket we're not right. a, I don't know that we're saving the world from spent grain um <laughs> but it is it is nice because it really does just go to waste so can't hurt to turn it into some dog treats then yeah uh, it's just cool to have a side project and, and make a little money um i want to say there's another little side project too am i oh i guess they they relate to each other just brewing? I mean, you're not selling beer, are you? No, although I would love to find out a way how to sell um, homebrew. So if anyone out there knows, let me know. There you go. Well, our, you know, your box is going to be ringing off the hook now. The dream. Yeah, you want to know the, the homebrewing dream? Sure. I would like to, I would like to open uh, Raleigh's smallest brewery. So I actually did some research and talked to some people about it and basically there's two there's two there's two things that i want to try to do so one is try to figure out how to sell your homebrew and the problem is you can't physically sell it so it's kind of like oh i wonder if you could sell tickets to an event like oh five dollar entry fee to kevin's backyard party where there's technically free homebrew and so something like that uh. um, or or i also was uh talking to an abc lawyer and they basically said you just need to get a permit for it but you yeah. have to own you have to own something and then you have to have it permitted to sell beer. And so basically they were like, you could build a shed in your backyard and as long as you get it permitted to sell beer, you could just have people come to it. <laughs> and so I, I always pictured like uh, you know, Raleigh's smallest brewery that is like literally my barn. Right. And it's like got two bar stools and I just have like a Google calendar system that you basically just like you know, sign up for a time and then you come to like the shed and sit on the stool and then you, right. you, know, you, drink, you drink the beer from Raleigh's smallest brewery. Oh, <laughs> but I just got like, yeah. like literally I got like two five gallon kegs and then it's like, which one do you want? You know, lighter, dark beer. <laughs> That's Hey, I, I, I support that. So yeah, instead of going to Kevin's house for a beer, go to Kevin's barn, spend a little money and <laughs> Park in the driveway. a local microbrewery. <laughs> Yeah, and then I think I would call it a nano brewery. Probably, what's smaller nano? Oh, smaller, there you micro? go, Pico. You can hit Pico if <laughs> you <Pico>. want. <laughs> oh man, that's that's funny. And yeah, I'll just share one thing because, of course, I'm thinking about it now. But so Kevin, for his bachelor party, did a road trip from Chicago <laughs> to Yellowstone, and had been brewing mead actually, which comes from honey instead of brewing other things instead through wine or beer. Yeah. But it was, right, it's not wine, it's fortified wine. Anyway, I learned a lot about mead that trip because um, when we were riding along in the van, we literally like made mead the first night in Minnesota and then it brewed by the time we got to South Dakota and then finished by the time we were actually in Yellowstone and we drank it and you tested it and it was pretty good. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> not that bad, even, even yeah, better. Yeah, I heard I forgot about that. Yeah, that's the uh, that would be at the Nano Brewery. You would just have the mason jars of you know little sample gotcha. batches of mead too. So nice. Yes. Well, and for our listeners who haven't heard of mead, just like I haven't, it was pretty good. And uh, you'll probably see it now if you're a beer drinker at some random breweries, and uh, you'll have to try it. All right. Well, I got a couple questions I ask people. Did we miss anything that you uh, wanted to touch on? Did I give enough advice? Yeah. Well, I actually, I've a couple people when I've paused like this, anything else, they're like a piece of advice. So yeah, if you got a piece of advice, this is the time. 
I think the only advice I would have is um, kind of like I talked about with bosses that another thing they don't really teach you in, in college is I feel like they talk about what job to get, but not what company to work for and who to work for. And I think that is missed a lot is research on, you know, not just what is the IBM job I'm getting, but what is IBM like and, and what's my boss going to be like and kind of those red flags. Like if you do find yourself at Friday at 6 p.m. with a guy on the other side of the computer yelling at you, you probably want to be thinking about a different role and it's not necessarily bad. And so I, I think just, you know, uh, a lot of people stay with toxic bosses a little bit too too long and making sure you know those red flags. And, and I think having trust in those work relationships is important. And that's kind of what I love about my job right now is like, I work for someone and for people who trust me and I trust them. And I think that's really important. And when you start to see that change, that's when it's time for a change. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that the people in our generation who are kind of coming out of school, especially if you know, you're marketable and have a good degree and some experience, like you can start calling your shots a little bit. And I think the first thing that's the most important is your boss to what you said. You interact with them every day. They got to hype you up. You got to get promoted, like stuff like that. And then the second thing is like, does your personal mission align and values align with the company's kind of mission and values? So most companies have them stated somewhere in their about us page on their internet. So I'd say if you're looking around for a job, it's good to kind of read that because yeah, an, an IBM, like a big corporation, you might not know what you're getting into. And if you value flexibility and time off and, uh, you know, trust and lots of other things, it's good to research before. It's super hard to know before, but it's good to research. So I totally agree. Yeah. And just a, a plug for Cloud Giants. If you go to cloudgiants.com, there is a link that says core values. And when this woman reached out to me and said, oh, do you want to work for Cloud Giants? And I said, who is that? This is the first thing I did. And yeah. this, it stuck out to me because you're right. Like you go to IBM.com. I, I don't know if they have a core values or mission statement. I'm sure they do somewhere. They're also a huge company. You got a million different websites. So this is also unique because it's like a small startup, right? But this was a huge, uh, a huge sign to me that it was a good place to work. Cause like I said, I can go to their website. I go to core values and, uh, the first one is people first. So I was like, Oh, I am working for someone who doesn't care about me. And I'm thinking about going to this job and what do they care about? Oh, people. And that's oh, the first thing. Me, a um, person. Yeah. And then um, the second one I love, it just says, keep it simple. And then next to it, where there's normally a big paragraph of text, it just says, enough said. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I love this. And then the very last one is just have fun. And there's a bunch of like emojis. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty bold. This company is like, we care about people. We want to keep it simple. And also we have fun. We literally put our emojis in the have fun section of our, yeah. our core values. And so, yeah, you're right. That I definitely didn't think about that at IBM and maybe not necessarily Red Hat, but it, it is important to know. Um, and if you are applying for a job that doesn't have core values on their website, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but that's a good question to ask, right? When they Great say, question. why do you want to work for us? You say, what are your core values? Why should I want to work for you? And then, uh, on top of why do you want me to work for you? So completely agree. And if it's not listed, that might be a yellow flag in itself. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen I've seen some LinkedIn stuff from either Kevin or Cloud Giants, where it does seem like they're kind of cutting edge or, or just, you know, straightforward with kind of what they're looking for. And I, I think that's great. And I think that people maybe later in their career, later in their careers, five years into your career, um, kind of gravitate toward a smaller company for that reason. It feels a little bit warmer and more trusting and a big corporation, which we were used to working for exclusively for a long time. And, you know, you, you kind of have that stability and that balance. Um, People want a little bit more out of work now, and that's the direction we're trending. So I echo everything Kevin's saying. Yeah, like uh, instead of at 5 p.m. on a Friday getting yelled at by my boss, I get a Slack message from my CEO with Disney Plus movie recommendations. So it's <laughs> definitely, definitely a different culture um, Yeah, that way. So Yeah, no, that's cool. Well, cool. Thanks, Kevin. This has been fun. I, again, just like all these, all of my friends, it's like, I kind of know what you do. I've talked to you over the years and I could never piece it together uh, until I do this kind of interview. So appreciate that. And I do have a couple more questions. So I'll start with the first one. What's well, been your biggest screw up? Um, I had trouble with this one. I, 
it sounds bad to say, but I don't think I've had a big screw up. And I think that's part of the screw up. Um, I think I could probably uh, introduce a little more risk into my life. Um, I think I probably a little bit overanalyze stuff at some point. And okay. so I don't have any cool story where it's like, oh, the server crashed and it was my fault. <laughs> um, but there's probably uh, there's probably plenty of opportunity that I could probably take a little more risk. So I think that's probably the biggest screw up is uh, maybe not trusting myself enough and, and overanalyzing and overthinking some things. Um, yeah, I, re I really liked that when I kind of read what you had typed up. But then I also saw there was some interview story that I don't know if you expanded on, but I'm, I'm just curious now. <laughs> I can tell this story, yeah. So we were talking about job interviews and like, um, you could consider this a screw up, but I will also say any of the mistakes I've made, I've learned from or put me in a position that ended up great. Like I love what I'm doing and where I'm at. So sure. I don't think any of it was a mistake. So it's probably a good thing I didn't get this job. Um, but I was, I was doing an interview, it was senior year of college and, um, it was one of those, I think it was for a consulting group, but basically what was happening was you did an interview with one person and it was very like, you know, where are you from? What are you looking for in a job? Very typical, like run through your resume job interview. What I didn't know was there was a second part of the interview in a different room with a different person that was that whole, um, it's like they do a thing like, tell me how many flags are in Atlanta. I don't yeah. care how many, but I, I, I want to know. All, I forget what it's called, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this one was that or it was like design the perfect remote, but don't design it. Just tell me how you think about designing it. But anyway, I didn't even know that this existed. So number one, those interviews, in my personal opinion, I hate because it's like, right a lot of pressure and you're like what do you mean how many flags are in atlanta i have no idea and the, so it's just very stressful and i don't know that it really tells you that much about a person but anyway so i already didn't like this type of interview and the fact that they had two different interviews with two different people in two different rooms so basically what happened is i walk into the first interview thinking all i'm going to do is talk to this guy run through my resume we're good so i talked to him it went pretty well i thought it was okay and then i step outside and I specifically remember it was like, I don't remember what time of year it was, but it was Raleigh. And I remember it was super hot because I was like mm -hmm. in a suit and I went outside and I think I was on the phone calling like, I don't know, my friend or my mom and like, yeah, the interview went great. Right. I think. So I'm out there just talking on the phone in the sun for like five minutes. And this guy comes running out of the room and was like, Mr. McCann, you, you didn't go to your interview. And I'm like, no, I just had my interview. And they're like, no, no, there's a second part. And I was like, what uh -oh. and so i go back in and i'm now like nervous because i was like oh there's an interview that i didn't prepare for and so there i am like had been sitting in the sun in my suit and now i'm also nervous so i'm like, sweating <laughs> buckets because i am in an interview that i didn't know happened that i'm now late for so it was like a 30 minute interview that i missed the first 15 minutes of it so they're trying to cram this 30 minute interview into 15 minutes i'm just sweating buckets because i am nervous and it was hot and there they are asking me you know, design your perfect remote. And I want to know how you would design it. And I think I, I talked like five minutes and I looked at the guys like, Hey, listen, I didn't know this was happening. I'm just gonna, <laughs> you know what? Never mind. Like, just basically like tore, tore my resume up. It's like, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't call me. <laughs> I retract my entire interview. I, yeah. You know what? I, I take it back. <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. Was, I, yeah. yeah brings me back to right i think the football stadium had interviews and you'd go in and out and have five in a day oh, yeah. and try to stay organized so cool next question so what is your mentor doing that you're not um frankly i i don't have a mentor so i was trying to think of something uh catchy like uh they or exist mentors. or yeah so i i have had Influences, mentors in the past yeah so probably the the main thing takeaway for me here is I should probably go get a mentor for sure. Ah. I will say that um, Red Hat and IBM had mentorship programs. So because they're bigger companies, I signed up for that. So I had mentors at those companies um, because I could sign up and was like, oh, I'm part of the mentoring program and I got someone assigned to me and and um, and I usually got along with them. So I have three or four uh, of those um, people who were mentors, but I, I don't really stay in touch with them like I should. Sure. Um, so I definitely should get one though, especially because I think it would be extremely helpful for me. Like I said, I'm a consultant without any consulting background. So I think 
knowing, especially the small company where it's like, oh, okay, well, you can consult about anything and you could grow and do this. So I think it, uh, it probably would be, it would behoove me to have a mentor, but I, yeah. I don't have one. So. And on that, to that point, you are open to being a mentor for others I see here. So that's, that's appreciated. I am. Yeah. If anyone wants help and I'm an industrial engineer, what should I do? Or how do you get into uh, a tech company or Salesforce questions? all ears we can talk about beer dogs volleyball whatever volleyball we haven't even touched on volleyball <laughs> me and kevin won an intramural championship in college yeah. humble brag and if you Next have any squad. spent grain you know where to go goodboydogtreats.com go. is that what the the website is uh it's actually uh goodboydogtreats.co because goodboydogtreats.com is owned by someone and for sale for like a thousand dollars so the annoying part is that it's not a dog treat company and it's not a real website if you go it just says it's for sale but it's nice. expensive so it's, so we got dot co because that's pretty close and it was cheap <laughs> yeah that's yeah i'm eric larson dot me because dot com was certainly taken by now <laughs> um all right well i think we're about done but of course I'm seeing now that um, what's something you care about and it's drinking and running. And I just, just, just to close <laughs> off, what's, uh, yeah. is it yeah, the, we can talk about that. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love uh, eating and drinking competitions that also involve running, especially if it's for a good cause. And so uh, the number one thing I do every year is I run the Krispy Kreme challenge, which started at NC state. I believe yep. it's the only the only place that does it, I suppose. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, Krispy Kreme challenge. You start at NC State's campus and you run two and a half miles to Krispy Kreme. You eat twelve donuts and then you run back. So you run total of five miles, total of twelve donuts. I believe this is my twelfth year in a row this year. Oh so I'm coming up on my dirty dozen. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, <laughs> but they raise they raise money for uh, local children's hospital, so it's also good to do that. So I also I do that, and I also have been known to run a beer mile. So that's where you drink a beer, run a quarter mile, and then do that four more times. So you drink four beers and run a mile. Beautiful. And hopefully also raise money for a charity. So That's in Philly, no? Uh, the, I, so I've done one in Philly where we actually ran a mile for each beer. So it was four miles and four beers, which is a little more oh, <laughs> intense. Uh, the local ones, there's a bunch of breweries that do it. So there's uh, one in Raleigh and one in Cary. I actually did one in my driveway last year because of COVID. So I'm hoping that will also be an annual thing. So come to Kevin's driveway, drink four beers and run a mile. <laughs> Come to Kevin's Pico Brewery and do a beer mile. Wow. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> cool. Well, thanks, Kevin. This is this has been fun. It's been uh, well, we've never chatted about work that much, but it's been a while since we caught up. Cool. Hopefully, I said something worthwhile. <laughs> there you go. 